Hi, this is Paul Castiglia, and you're listening to Foul Players Radio, the one-stop shop for all your pop culture needs. And folks, welcome back to another episode of Foul Players Radio. My name is Michael Spedden. You're watching us on YouTube. If you're seeing me right now, you'll see that I have a face for radio and you're watching us on our YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe, hit that subscribe button, like it, and make sure you get all your friends to subscribe too. You can also find us at www.foulplayersradio.com. When I was a boy back in the mid-1970s, my grandparents used to take my aunt and I to Assateague Island every summer for a week or two for vacation. It was a long, hot ride down Route 50. Uh, most of the time, it was only two lanes back in those days. So it was a very long ride with traffic and everything. And to keep me from being a typical kid and barraging my grandparents with, are we there yet? Are we there yet? My grandparents used to stop at the store and get me comic books to read in the car to keep me occupied. These comics were things like Superman, Superboy, Batman, Archie, and Little Archie. Recently, I met Paul Castiglia, who is a comic book writer and editor known for his work uh, on Archie Comics, Archie's Weird Mysteries, Archie's Americana series, Little Archie, Looney Tunes Magazine, Teenage Ninja Turtles, Tex Avery Comics, the DC Comics series Showcase, Sonic the Hedgehog, Cracked Magazine, and others. We had a great time talking about those comic books, as well as some interesting facts behind the song Sugar Sugar. The twangy, typical 60s rock and roll piped into sitcoms. Whenever there's an episode uh, when one of the characters puts together a band, you know, think Opie on Andy Griffith, Chip on My Three Sons, The Mosquitoes on Gilligan's Island. We also talked about sea monkeys and all the gimmicky ripoff offers in the back of comic books, disturbing puppets from children's television shows, and a whole lot more. Uh, we have links to his blog, Scared Silly by Paul Castiglia.blogspot.com, and his IMDb page, his Wikipedia page, and others in the show notes. So make sure you check those, click on them, and check it out. He also had a recent appearance on the Laurel and Hardy podcast talking about the 1928 movie Habeas Corpus. We had a lot of fun talking about old movies, too. So I really think you'll enjoy this episode. The Foul Players of Perryville will be returning to the Western Maryland Scenic Railroad on August 13th, September 10th, October 8th, and October 29th. For more information, please see www.wmsr.com or foulplayersofperryville.com. We'll be right back with Paul Castiglia right after these words. Hi, this is Bud Becker, and you're listening to Foul Players Radio. Hello, this is John Piat, Kevin Schmidt, and Jerry Bozick. And we're, we're August, August, a little band from Virginia. You can hear our story, other stories from the legendary Baltimore, D.C. music scene, and much, much more with Michael Spedden on Foul Players Radio. You can find it at www foulplayersradio.com on YouTube and wherever you find podcasts online. Keep, Keep rocking. rocking. This is A.D. Adams and you are tuned in to Foul Players Radio with your host, Michael Spedden. Yeah, hi, this is David Simmons from DC Star and I am just encouraging all of you to tune in to Michael Spedden's show on Foul Players Radio and love the rock and roll of the past and the art of the future. Hello, folks. I'm here with Rebecca Jessup from the Having a Grace Arts Collective. Uh, Rebecca, tell us about all the events that you have coming up for August. We have a lot going on. The majority of them are going to be at the Opera House, which is in Having a Grace. But um, here is the lowdown. So at the beginning on uh, the first weekend in August, August 5th and 6th and 7th, we have something called the Having a Grace Mosaic Project. And this is an immersive presentation in our black box where folks can come in have images all around them. And it uh, talks about the years of Inhabited Grace from 1900 to 1925. And in the future, there'll be additional ones for, for additional decades. Um, also, we are celebrating our fifth anniversary in the first weekend. So on August the 6th, we will be having our big hair birthday bash with <laughs> Eclipse, the ultimate journey tribute band. 
Um, you don't want to miss that. That's going to be really big fun. And uh, we're going to have throwback prices for wine and beer. On uh, Friday, August 12th, we have the Eric Bird Trio. It's going a little bit different from Journey to the Eric Bird Trio, which is some jazz. You can sit back and just relax. Um, and then, of course, for the kids on August the 13th, that's Saturday, we have uh, stories, folk tales, and fables for the young and young at heart uh, here in the fire hall, which is one of the uh, spaces we have here at the Opera House. We have the actual theater, we have the black box, and then we have the fire hall where we have some, um, some events. So that's definitely all family oriented that for the stories, folk tales, and fables. Um, and then on um, August the 13th, the same day in the evening, we have a rockin' band called Revolution Heroes. You come here and rock the night away. So for something a little different, we have a week later on August the 20th, you can, we have the Madam Mims Experience, tarot readings for everyone. So you can come, have your tarot, uh, tarot cards read and see what's going to go on in your life. Everyone wants to know about that. Uh, the majority of our events are at the Opera House, but this event um, on August the 20th, which is also Saturday, you'll be having at the new Star Center, which is previously the Harvard Grace High School, which is now a beautiful, wonderful performing arts venue. We will be having David Clark's All About Joel, Billy Joel Tribute. And we expect to have a really big uh, crowd there. It's gonna be wonderful. So sit back and relax and hear all your favorite Billy Joel songs. Here's something a little bit different too. On Sunday, August 21st, you can have body paint yoga. <laughs> so it's a way to express yourself using yoga and then painting with your body. So you definitely wanna check that out. August 27th, we have uh, a wonderful musician, excuse me, magician. His name is Rand Shine. His real name is Randy Shine. And we will have a master class in magic followed by a magic show right afterwards. So that'll be fun for families and kids. On, um, uh, though that will actually take us to the end of August. Um, for folks wanting more information, this was a whole lot. Uh, you can find out more at www.hdgarts collective.org. Also, one thing I didn't mention is we have a great youth arts program and all the programs are on the website. They are all free for children. It includes painting, um, all, all kinds of crafts. And that generally happens on Saturday mornings at 10. So uh, that's what we have. Wonderful. Folks, make sure you go check out all of these programs and all these shows that they have over there. Um, they're really putting together some great things for us in the community. So uh, thank you, Rebecca. And folks, make sure you go check it out. Thank you. And here we are, folks, another episode of Foul Players Radio. And today's guest is somebody who is, he's got his hands in just a little bit of everything here and uh, all kinds of things that are sort of up my alley. And I think it will be up yours too, if you're a regular listener, uh, Mr. Paul Castiglia. Welcome, Paul. It's great to have you. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Michael. Well, you know, we're, I, I don't even know where to start with you because there's so many interesting things and uh, interesting things that you've done in your career here. Um, you know, in, in the world of comics and, you know, being a you know, historian, like you had mentioned, um, being involved in some film and television projects, you know, writing for comics, um, so many things here uh, that you've done. And um, I'm just looking over all your work here and it's just really amazing stuff. So uh, kudos to you for this. Um, I've been very fortunate. So thank you. Yeah, great, great. Yeah, you I've had I, a lot of great opportunities. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And um, you know, the uh, the one thing I guess I wanted to kind of start off with is that um, I, I guess I may have kind of told you the story when we were um, you know, kind of doing our pregame. And you know, when I was a kid, you know, my grandparents used to take me to uh, down to the ocean, Ocean City, Maryland, or Assateague, and. Um, you know, I was in the back of the car. We had the uh, 72 Impala with the black seats, and I was having third-degree burns on the back of my legs from sitting in that. And um, to keep my mouth shut, to keep me quiet, and to stop asking, are we there yet, they bought me a big old pile of Archie 
and uh, Superboy Comics uh, to keep me quiet on the way down there. And I really enjoyed those. And I you know, also liked the cartoons that were on as well. You know, that's where we, we got Sugar Sugar and a whole bunch of other things. But um, you've been involved with those comics for you know, a good bit. You were a uh, lead writer on Archie's Weird Mysteries and a contributing writer to the Archie comic book. So I, I'd like to know a bit about that because um, I do have a lot of fond memories of those. Uh, so I guess tell us you know, how you got involved, how you got on board, and what was it like to get your foot in the door there first, I guess? Oh, sure. Well, well, you know, I always wanted to be involved in comics or animation from the time I was a little kid. And my memories go back to around the time I was four or five years old, which would be school you know, around 69, 1969, 1970, watching TV. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the first things I did was I filled up a notebook with drawings of Huckleberry Hound and Yogi Bear. Uh, <laughs> yes. Those notebooks, I think, are still in my parents' house somewhere in the attic. I really should take those out. Mm -hmm. uh, but I wanted to do this. And so, you know, I went to School of Visual Arts for college in New York City. And I majored in animation and I minored in cartooning. Uh, but what happened was when I graduated, I realized I didn't really have anatomy perspective or composition down as well as my fellow classmates. Mm -hmm. So I, I was, I just knew like I wasn't going to be able to compete. So I had to think on my feet and like, well, well, you know, I, I'm good at storytelling. You know, I come up with some crazy ideas for stories and I think visually, mm -hmm. you know, and everything I learned in art school was about thinking visually you know, how do you get a story across visually? So I put together a portfolio of picture scripts, you know, somewhere in between like what a comic book would look like or a storyboard for a film, but not super polished, uh, you know, enough where an editor can look at it, know what's going on, but it was never going to be something that was professional enough that they were going to publish it as a drawing. So uh, I took that around. Uh, I got some freelance work from DC Comics, writing for Looney Tunes magazine. Oh. And shortly thereafter, I interviewed for an assistant editor job at Archie. And I got that job. I started there in January of 1990. Mm. Uh, as things progressed, I became a, a full-time editor myself. And you know, before I was done, I was an editor. I was writing comics. I was a historian for the company. I was putting together vintage reprint collections. Uh, I was even getting involved in some licensing and marketing, a lot of copywriting or writing press releases and, and trade advertisements and catalog copy. And, you know, it was a big, big chunk of my life. Uh, uh -huh. I, I, I was at the company for about a decade on staff. And afterwards, uh, I continued to freelance for them for a bit, doing a yeah. variety of things. Uh, but that's how I got into it. Uh, as far as the writing of stories, uh, the the first opportunity they gave me, I think, was 1991, I think. 1990 or 91. It was like within within my first year and a half there, I wrote a story for a, a series called Archie 3000, uh -huh. which was Archie, <laughs> Archie like in the year 3000. Uh, very futuristic. So I had fun with that. Uh, you know, I got to do a lot of what I would call standard Archie stories. Uh, and, and at one point, they brought back the concept of Little Archie. Yes. Which, uh, you said you were a big fan of Little Archie. Little Archie in its original form was just the adventures of the characters, but when they were like kids, you know, mm -hmm. before they, way before they were in high school. And uh, in the early 90s, they, they decided to give it a shot as almost like a Calvin and Hobbes type of style. <laughs> so they changed the style a little bit and made it a little, even more whimsical in some ways. Uh, and I wrote a bunch of those. Those were fun. Um, you know, and, and I just got to work on so many things there. I worked on some of their licensed stuff uh, that they licensed from other other companies like Sonic the Hedgehog, Teenage Mutant mm. Ninja Turtles. Uh, but the, the, the longest running thing that I did for them that was story scripting was Archie's Word Mysteries. Mm. And Archie's Word Mysteries was, was a comic book series that was based on the animated series of the same name. And the way that came about was Deke Animation had optioned uh, Archie to do a, a series. They had previously done a series called The New Archies. You know, this gets very confusing because the New Archies were older than the Little Archies, 
but they weren't as old as the regular Archies. <laughs> yeah, so the the Archies, it was like a Saturday morning show that Deke did, and it was they were yeah they were like in that uh, that, that tween tween age stage. But mm -hmm. uh, they wanted to do another show, and they they came to us uh, to the company with this idea of putting um, Archie and the gang into sort of supernatural and, and paranormal type of situations. <laughs> um, you know, uh, kind of like Archie meets X-Files. Mm -hmm. Sure, and sure, sure. So one of, you know, one of my um, roles on that was I, I had to provide them with some good reference material, uh, you know, to help them figure out how they were going to do the show and give them some insight into their scripts. And, and so kind of like a behind the scenes, helping them develop it. Mm. Uh, in the meanwhile, I'm telling uh, the, uh, the, the managing editor there, Victor Gorelick, uh, at the time, mm. I'm telling him, boy, you know, I really, I think there should be a comic book series. If this show goes on TV, there should be a comic book series to accompany it. And I really want to write it. You know, and I made my case, you know, said, you know, I just love this stuff. I love the mixing of the, the spooky stuff with the humor. And so they gave me a shot with it. Uh, it ran three and a half years and 34 issues. Uh, I drew upon uh, my love of Kolshak the Night Stalker, which you <laughs> might remember, which was the, the great TV movie in the uh -huh. early 70s. And then they, they did two movies and then they spun it out into a show. And that was just terrific. That really inspired me. Um, all Abbott and Stalby, Frankenstein, of course, was a big inspiration. Oh, yeah. And then there was a movie around 85, I want to say 85, 86, called Night of the Creeps, which I mm. love. It's a, it's a great movie. It's a funny backstory to that. I was with a college buddy of mine, and we wanted to see Stand By Me. And it was sold out. So he's looking at the marquee, and he's like, hey, look, Night of the Creeps, that sounds good. <laughs> and then I was saying to myself, oh, no, the last time this guy said something sounded good, it was The Alchemist, which was a terrible movie that I didn't <laughs> like, right? So, but he talked me into it and we went and I realized this movie's great. I really love this movie. And one of the things I loved about it was it felt like Archie and Jughead in like um, a goofy horror movie. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it really felt like, like that already. So I was already kind of inspired and wanted to do this. Um, funny story about Archie's Weird Mysteries was that uh, it ran on a station called PAX, which is a very short-lived station. Yes, I remember PAX, yeah. And, and it ran for four months. So the comic came out uh, maybe a couple months after it started running, but then it stopped airing. But the comic right. kept going. The comic was doing well in sales. People liked it. It had a fan base. But somewhere along the line, uh, about at the two year mark or so, the sales started to drop off a bit. Right. And the editor said to me, he said, you know what? We're gonna have to change the format. We're gonna get rid of the weird. And he says to me, I want you to make these more realistic mysteries like Scooby-Doo. And I'm like, like Scooby-Doo? <laughs> I said, those aren't realistic. I said, and furthermore, people are already, you know, unfairly compare Archie's Word Mysteries to Scooby-Doo, you know, which I always would say in interviews, it's not the same because it's not a, you know, a guy in a mask, mm -hmm. you know, trying to bilk somebody out of their inheritance, but Archie <laughs> meets an alien or Bigfoot in Archie's Word Mysteries, he's really meaning an alien or Bigfoot. So mm -hmm. That was a big point of differentiation, but it ended up going for another 10 issues without the weird in the title, and mm -hmm. it, it was kind of like a CSI light Oh, you know, okay. Like, like a forensics thing. So it became Archie's Mysteries for a while. But but the punchline of it is, by the time the first um, issue of the non-weird uh, iteration mm -hmm. of the series came on the stands, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, the Archie's Weird Mysteries cartoon show was resurrected and went to syndication. Oh. And it, and it never went off the air. Wow. It stayed, it's, it's still on the air. It's well, been on the air ever since. So hey. it's kind of one of those funny stories where, you know, we were just kind of behind the timing of it. But, uh, you know, it had a good run. It's fondly remembered by a lot of people. I enjoyed writing it. We had a fantastic artist, Fernando Ruiz, mm -hmm. doing all the art. Uh, he was awesome to collaborate with. 
Uh, but yeah, that, that was Archie's word mysteries. Right. Right. Wow. Wow. That that's, that's really something. And again, that, that is really such a big, um, I, I think it was probably one of the most influential, you know, both cartoons and comic books. I mean, they've been around. So when did they start that series? Oh, Archie comics itself. Well, Archie yeah. comics, uh, they, they started life as a company called MLJ publications. Yeah. In 39, I think. So yeah. Was, you know, in response to everything blowing up with action comics and Superman, all yeah. these publishers were getting into comics. A lot of them had been publishing pulp magazines mm -hmm. or other types of publications. And, mm -hmm. you know, of course, when there's a success, everybody comes along and says, oh, I want to see if I can make a buck off of this too, right? Right, so right. MLJ came up and they were doing superheroes because that's mm -hmm. what everybody was doing uh, the first couple of years of their existence. But in Pep Comics, oh boy, I'm blanking down the issue number. It was Pep Comics in 19, December 1941. I know that much. Pep Comics number 22. Uh, yep. Forgive me if I have some memory lapses. My memory is not what it once was. It was <laughs> Pep Comics number 22, December 1941. There was a little five-page story. Uh, I think it was the second or third story but introducing Archie. Right, right, uh, right. It started to, like it always did with the Adventures of the Shield, who was the first patriotic superhero even before Captain America. Mm -hmm. But then all of a sudden, here's this, you know, weird little redhead kid, Archie, and it took off. Right, and, right. And um, so much so that they, within a year, they changed the name of the company from MLJ to Archie Comic Publications mm -hmm. or Archie Comics. And um, and Archie took over Pep Comics. He became right. a cover feature. Mm -hmm. uh, even the, they had a club. This is something interesting I put in the book uh, that I researched. I did a, um, a collection of early S.H.I.E.L.D. stories uh, that I researched. They were, uh, I think they were all drawn by Irv Novick. And um, I forget the, uh, the writer at the moment, but um, but it, it was kind of a, a chronology of his earliest adventures from the 1940s uh, that I researched and compiled. And I found on the inside covers of the comics, there, were, there would always be an ad for the Shield Club. And you could mm -hmm. send in your dime and you get like a little badge and your membership <laughs> card and I forget, some other kind of tchotchke, right? And then at some point in 1942, all of a sudden, yeah, I was Shield and his sidekick, um, Dusty, saying, um, well, gang, you know, the Shield Club is, is uh, you know, we're shutting down the Shield Club, but we've got good news for you. You can join the Archie Club. And it was like a <laughs> literal passing of the torch between the Shield and Archie. Uh, but yeah, they started in the 40s. Uh, they, they just kept running. Uh, the 1940s comics were what I like to, I like to call them the equivalent of pre-code movies. Uh, the mm -hmm. 1940s Archie stories were very freewheeling. Um, you know, some of the topics and scenarios were a little wild, huh. you know, PG or PG-13 at times, um, you know, but still good natured fun. You know, they start to become a little more streamlined in the 50s, in the 1950s, uh, still a lot of humor. Uh, and then it's it's in the 60s. It's like the midway point through the 60s where the comic starts taking on a real streamlined look and approach. Uh, and a lot, of, a lot of that had to do with this great artist, Dan DiCarlo, who was drawing a lot of the stories. Uh, he really streamlined them. That was part of it. The other part of it was Filmation. The animation studio came and, and to Archie and said, we want to option these characters. They had already had success uh, with DC Comics characters that they had done in the um, 60, I think through 66 through 68, they had done Superman, Batman, Aquaman, Superboy, and a whole host of other characters. So they wanted to see what other comics they could do. And they were kind of in this pitching war with Hanna-Barbera because Hanna-Barbera was starting to do the same thing. And in fact, Hanna-Barbera ended up with Josie and the Pussycat, which was mm -hmm. also owned by Archie. Uh, yeah, yeah. But Filmation took on Archie and it became a smash hit on Saturday morning. And mm -hmm. they incorporated this idea that they were not only these, you know, high school teenagers, 
getting involved in goofy, you know, situations and, and you know, pranking each other or whatever, uh, but also that they were a band. Right? Yes, and yes, the, yes. The band thing, the Archie's, <laughs> The Archie's thing came out of the comics. So a few years earlier, it was in Life with Archie, they did a story where they put together a band. You know, they were inspired by the Beatles. So mm -hmm. Archie and his friends put together together a band. Now, as the story goes, um, Don Kirshner had this song, Sugar Sugar, and he wanted the monkeys to record. Mm -hmm. And they, they turned it down. At this point, they were like, now we really just want to do more sophisticated stuff and more of our own stuff. Um, you know, understandably so. And, um, you know, Don Kirsch was like, what am I going to do? And his kid was reading this comic book I mentioned. And he saw this comic with these Archies. And he's like, oh, these guys can't talk back to me. They can't tell me they don't want to record the song. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. <laughs> and it was like they created this thing. So the shows had... Um, songs in them you know in every episode mm -hmm. uh the archies uh they had a great writing team behind them and this a really great vocalist ron dante dante uh, yes i was gonna say that yeah really nice guy I, I did a convention once uh where they they paired us together mm -hmm. uh, it was like a new york comic-con and i think they they had all these other like writers and artists together who were working on different books but but they couldn't pair me with somebody they couldn't pair him with anybody so they paired mm -hmm. us together and uh i spent like a whole afternoon one day you know <laughs> fans were coming up to get autographs of our of our work but uh, for me it was mm -hmm. more about talking to ron and and just you know getting his insights about what it was like to record those songs and he had also done a, a huge thing in my childhood which was uh there was a record album put out by buddha records called spider-man a rock comic <laughs> it was a record it was a full-length spider-man story it featured spider-man uh aunt aunt may uncle ben uh J. jonah jameson i think might have been in it uh dr strange was in it it, came mm -hmm. in. it was this whole thing and it came with a gatefold sleeve and it had this great john romino art and um and they had songs on that too and those songs were credited to the web spinners but of course, the web spinners were, were was Ron Dante and studio musicians, and yeah. uh, you know Ron Dante just was on, involved in so many different things. I've uh, heard a number yeah, of that's, that's how that's how they became. You know, they were always big Archie comics, but then it became like a huge phenomenon mm -hmm. going into the seventies because of what happened in nineteen sixty nine, which was the TV cartoon aired on Saturday morning for the first time, and that song "Sugar Sugar." became the number one selling single of 1969. And so for the next mm -hmm. decade, they rode that, that wave of popularity. They, there was numerous Saturday morning Archie shows from Filmation uh, through that decade. And uh, the, the comic sales were high then, you know. Um, yeah, so that that's kind of like how Archie began and the height of Archie mania uh, you know, and I came along, you know, like I said, in 1990 was when I started with Archie. I wanted to, you know, the, the one thing that I, uh, because I had heard you just mentioned Ron Dante, you know, with you know, Sugar Sugar, and there wasn't a lot that he didn't write back then, it seems like. I mean, he had a whole big body of works. So I've read a number of articles and heard a couple of interviews with him on different shows and stuff like that. And oh, sure. And we'll um, do a lot of stuff with Barry Manilow. Yes, yes, very I true. Found out, I just found out that he did um, he did some uh, work with Pat Benatar. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, but then they they um, switched out the record company switched out the project to other producers. Oh, okay. Which okay. sometimes happens. So I I don't know if his versions. I think it's I think it's heart heartbreaker and you better run. I don't know if uh, his versions of those songs uh, are out there anywhere. I would love mm -hmm. to hear them if they are, but his, you know, I'd love to hear how he approached the production of it. You know, right? I mean, the one the one thing I'd like to find out about too, and I'm sure you're in my age group. And you, we watched a lot of the same shows coming up. Um, it seemed like in a lot of those sitcoms back in those days, you know, like especially from the ones when we were like little, and even before that, there was always an episode. It seems like you know, a lot of sitcoms just have that same episode. Um, a lot of them have had it where, for some reason, there's a boxing match, 
and you know the big bully gets knocked out accidentally by the guy who's the wimp you know that's one thing but it always seemed like like on my three sons and on andy griffith you know opie there's always a bunch of kids like there's always an episode where they have a band you go to the garage and there's this twangy 60s music it sounds like it's being played through a transistor radio um and it seemed like it was like almost always like the same sounding music like it and <laughs> yeah i'd just like to know who wrote that stuff because um oh yeah well there were guys who were always doing that stuff yeah and there's yeah. like whole libraries right kpm is it kpm i, I think, think so libraries that did a lot of a lot of their stuff ended up on in the 1967 spider-man cartoon Mm-hmm. But that that kind of motif of having a band or or just those scenarios with boxing matches and mm-hmm. picking on the bullies. I mean, it's all it's all cyclical. It is. I it mean, is. So, yeah. I mean, Archie was a phenomenon, but it didn't it didn't uh, come out of thin air. Right. Right. Uh, there was there was a a nineteen. I don't know. I'm gonna mess up the date. Earlier than Archie, I'll say. So I don't mm-hmm. mess up the date. There was a newspaper strip called Harold Teen. Mm. Uh, which um, you look at it, it's like, oh, that's a definite influence. And of course, you know, Henry Aldrich on radio and Andy Hardy in movies. And I mean, and even that, you know, it's like, oh, well, you know, we got to save the orphanage. Let's put on a show, you uh-huh. know? So they're doing, you know, big band. Uh, but, you know, it's the same story as when the 60s and 70s kids do a rock band, you know? It's mm-hmm. really right, the right. <laughs> yeah. the music changed, that's all. Right. But there were there was it seemed like there was always um you know a band shows up and they play that same twangy fifty. Oh, yeah. I know which you know, I know the style you're t- talking yeah, about. And yeah. sometimes there's a lot of horns in it. Yeah, there's horns in it, but there's no horn player in the band. Right. There's no horn player scene. Yeah. <laughs> or or the other thing too, it's like um, you know, somebody comes in and says, Well, let's hear a song, and then like the music starts and they all look like they're taken by surprise and they like start strumming real quick of course they're lip syncing the whole thing yeah and, uh, the strum- but- and the strumming can be accompanied by strings or percussion and there's no, <laughs> yeah. there's no you know yeah, that, that aren't there you know there's no <laughs> position in sight to play them. <laughs> that's funny um i was looking at um you know, some more of, of your uh, you know uh, credits and things like that and you worked with cracked magazine yeah, Crack was something I did early on in my writing career. I only did a few of those. Okay. Uh, those were fun, you know, hmm. uh, just a way to stretch my muscles and do something a little different. Hmm. Uh, Gary Fields, who I've known for a long time, great cartoonist, uh, he did at least one or two of those stories. He, he drew them. Hmm. Uh, you know, I'm always very uh, fortunate. I've always been very fortunate to have great artists you know, drawn by comic stuff. So <laughs> yeah, he was one of them. Dan Parent drew that first uh, Archie mm-hmm. story I ever wrote. Uh, and he's like a legendary Archie artist now. Um, and so many great artists that I've gotten to work with through the years uh, that worked on my stuff. So I'm very fortunate, like I said. Yeah, yeah. Um, Mike Rasigliano was a guest of mine on, um, on my show here. Um, the reason I had him on was because he uh, drew a lot of uh, comics in the sports page for the Baltimore Sun. I'd say for well over 30 years. I think he may have came here in the mid 80s and went on, I think, until maybe about eight or 10 years ago. And always, you know, whenever there was a hot topic with the Orioles or the Ravens or anything, he'd always, you know, be drawing comics to go with it. And he drew uh, for Cracked Magazine. Um, a lot he said a lot of what he drew were like little things that would be going on in the margins like little characters and things like that in the margins of the page okay and um he wrote for them um i I don't remember the the range i guess i should know my own show but after you've done 270 of them um (laughs) even you get real specific like that um it may slip your mind but yeah um and i I used to read a cracked Cracked was something like mad. I kind of, I kind of had to sneak those in the house. Yeah. Uh, because yeah. I wasn't, you know, when I was little, you know, my parents were like, eh, eh, no, you're not reading that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, mad was mad was the filet mignon, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. Uh, the crack was more like the hamburger, I think. Uh, or yeah. The, or the, you know, <laughs> the mad was on a uh, was definitely on a higher level. Mm-hmm. Not that we didn't do great work at crack. We all did, but oh yeah, yeah. I yeah. think in general. Um, there was just um, 
just legendary talents that they had working there. Oh, so sure. You're not going to top. You're not going to top them. You can come close though. So I think that's what we mm -hmm. always did at Crack. But I wasn't in Crack too long. I just did a few. Um, I think one of them may not have even been printed. Sure, uh, sure. At least sure. two of them were. I think I, I think I may have written three scripts and two were, two were printed. So mm -hmm. I'm happy for that. Wow, wow. Well, that, but still, you know, I mean, that that is a national, if not worldwide, magazine. I mean, it does have a lot of subscribers and readers and everything. And uh, you had also written a bit on, um, you had mentioned Looney Tunes magazine and some DC comics. Um, yeah, DC. Um, I did. I started out doing some stuff for Looney Tunes magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, remember, I mentioned that little portfolio I put together. Uh, mm -hmm. I got it in the hands of one of my uh, teachers from School of Visual Arts. Joe Orlando, who was working at DC Comics, and he was oh. he was a legendary writer, artist, editor of comics. He could do it all. I learned so much from him. I actually learned a lot about storytelling from him taking mm -hmm. his drawing class uh, because he used to um, give us this weekly assignment where we had to take a, a picture from a newspaper or a magazine, mm -hmm. and then we had to draw the before panel and the after panel. So mm -hmm. we had to make it into something sequential. And right. it was it was like an exercise in figuring out how to tell the story and mostly visual. And then he would make a stand at the back of the room. Mm. Uh, and there's this thing called spotting the blacks, which means, you know, how much how much ink are you going to use to define a figure? You know, that mm -hmm. was black ink. Um, and we would stand at the back of the room and his whole thing was like, well, can you still tell what's going on from back here? You mm -hmm. know, without having to read the the word balloons and if you could still tell what was going on then you did well that week you mm. know mm. so anyway i uh, he was editing uh, this looney tunes magazine which was uh it wasn't a comic book it was a magazine it was games puzzles articles and it had some comic stories in it and sure, yeah. i had dropped my portfolio with him and he was the first one to give me work uh he said yeah your stuff's good it's funny um i, I like the feel of it uh he remembered me from is this was like a like a year and a half or maybe mm -hmm. a little more than a year and a half after I graduated. Um, I don't know. If, I don't think I took his class my senior year. Yeah, so it it was probably two and a half years out of me taking his taking his class, but um, he gave me my first break, mm -hmm. you know, and that led to the Archie gig. But later on, around ninety four, um, I approached another editor at DC who was editing Showcase. And I said, you know, I'd really just like to write a one-off mm -hmm. story for Showcase. Uh, and we just batted all kinds of ideas around. Uh, I, I think one of them was a Plastic Man idea because I loved Plastic Man. You know, <laughs> yeah. Since I was a kid, you know, I, I, you know, I saw him first in the book, the, uh, the Great Comic Book Heroes by Jules Pfeiffer. Mm -hmm. which reprinted a lot of these great 1940s stories. And that's what, that was my first exposure to Plastic Man. Mm. And then my father would take me to comic conventions in New York City. Uh, and we would go on Sunday. And uh, he, he got the gist uh, pretty quickly that if you, if you start like approaching these guys around 3, 30, 4 o'clock, you can get some real bargains on some, you know, vintage comics. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I, would, I was often getting three plastic man 1940s comic books for the price of two uh because of that you know they were be beat up you know what i call reader copies but I'll, that's all i wanted to do is i wanted to look at them and read the stories mm -hmm. you know but i and so i'm sure i floated a plastic man idea past him part of me oh. <laughs> and um then there was another idea <clears throat> and I forget now the characters. It might have been Angel and the Ape or some kind of goofy characters that they had. And Starro, uh, which was this crazy uh, starfish, alien starfish character that they ended up using in the most recent Suicide Squad movie. Mm. So any of these things like that you see uh, in the comics no matter how absurd, and there was a lot of like absurd things in DC Comics <laughs> yeah. in the 50s and and through like the early to mid 60s, they could still turn up when you least expect it. But anyway, none of that came to pass. 
<clears throat> instead, I ended up writing a story about Bibbo, who's Superman's pal. Mm. And Bibbo is kind of like, um, he's almost like Popeye come to life. Oh, and yeah, okay. He owns this bar. And um, so the story that I ended up writing for DC was a story about this guy. He screwed something up at his office, something to do with computers or whatnot. Messed everything up. And he was going to jump off the bridge. And so Bilbo comes along and he says, what are you doing? You can't do that. And he's, he says, ah, oh, you know, I really failed. You know, I was given this task and I failed and I can't face it. And Bilbo says, hey, let me tell you about some times when I had come up against, you know, extraordinary obstacles and, and how I persevered, you know. So he starts telling these tall tales about fighting all these DC Comics villains. Mm -hmm. So that was the gist of the story. He's trying to encourage the guy to, to not jump off the bridge. Oh, Spoiler okay. alert. Yeah. <laughs> guy doesn't jump off the bridge. Um, <laughs> I don't write stories like that. But, um, but what was interesting about it was at the time, this is a little behind the scenes, at that time, the way DC Comics was set up, each of the characters had its own, what they called group editor. Mm. So there was maybe um, two or three or four or five different Batman related comics. It was a group mm -hmm. editor just for Batman. Same with Superman. Now, maybe there'd be a few less issues for the Flash or, or Green Lantern or Justice League, but they all had people in charge, group editors. So all of these group editors had to review my script because the villains from each of these, you know, mm -hmm. franchises within the larger franchise, so to speak, were, were in the story. And oh, yeah. uh, the, the most interesting part was I have Bibbo telling a story about coming up against the Joker. And I get, you know, notes back from my editor, or maybe it was a phone call. And he was like, hey, you, I spoke to the Batman group editor. You can't mention Batman. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? I go, well, in the current Batman continuity, nobody's actually sure if Batman really exists. <laughs> He's like an urban myth, an urban legend. I'm like, yeah, but the Joker is the one who mentions Batman. And he's been pounded in the chin a billion times by Batman. I'm he sure he's he, well aware of Batman. Yeah. He knows he exists. <laughs> and he's, my, he's like, yeah, I know, I know, but you can't say Batman. So mm -hmm. I figured out a way around it. You know, I, uh, I just altered the dialogue a bit to, mm -hmm. to allude to Batman without actually using the word Batman. Right. But a little funny behind the scenes story. But yeah, that was the gist of the work I had done for DC. It was fun mm -hmm. just to be able to do that and have, you know, my name in the credits and uh, and all that uh, for DC comic with with, you know, some pretty uh, major uh, characters in it. And I had so, been in that. I was in an episode of Gotham. Oh, um, cool. And I was in the last episode filmed and the third to last to air. Um, now, prior to that, I hadn't read a um, superhero comic book since like 1978. So I had some catching up to do on, uh, you know, I mean, I, I did watch Gotham and from time to time, I'd be like, okay, I remember that. I remember the Scarecrow. Okay. The Scarecrow came back and, you know, of course, Batman and Robin and Alfred. And of course, you know, like, like the, the, the villains you'd see all the time. Right. But then there were other ones that were like, well, wait a minute. Hmm. maybe i saw that villain on the super friends once the cartoon and maybe. uh but i had to kind of do you some research and make sure i was fairly up on things you know um well yeah because some of the yeah. characters would stay consistent through the years and others would just yeah. be um mm -hmm. you know ret retro retrofitted rebooted mm -hmm. you know uh you know some of them would get really redone right to the point where it's just the name that's the same Mm -hmm. And others are like, they keep some elements from the past and they throw some new mm -hmm. things into it, you know? Yeah. I, and I, I was hoping to, um, there's a lot of people that follow me on Twitter just because I was Dale on Gotham. And, mm -hmm. um, I tell you th these people that, that really follow, uh, that really get themselves, you know, as fans entrenched into these comics, um, it's almost like, um, it's almost like the Star Trek people who know every episode of Star Trek and all the 
different Star Treks. They know their DC comics. They know their Gotham. They know their Batman comics and everything. And um, they're all pulling. They're all pulling a for Gotham to make a comeback on another channel. And B, they love me, so they want Dale to come back too. <laughs> because the thing is, is that well, if you noticed on Gotham, I think everybody died at least three times. You know, Dale only got to die once. So uh, I have four lives left or two more chances. And, um, but I tell you, God bless them. I mean, they have just been, um, you know, they follow the things that I do and they're always sending me nice notes and everything. And, you know, you, you got to love that, you know, oh, that's it's, good. Yeah. And that's, that's gratifying. And, you know, the whole, it really the whole is. thing, the whole thing about not remembering like the fans remember, and that's mm -hmm. cool. You know, they talk, they show that uh, in galaxy quest mm -hmm. really well, right. About how the, and that actually ends up being, you know, how the day is saved mm -hmm. because these fans remember certain things from an episode and it turns out they can actually use these principles to right. save the right. day. So it's a, it's a brilliant script. Um, but, you know, I think you have to be gracious about it. You know, mm -hmm. um, my, um, my dear departed friend, Dan Necrosis, uh, is a buddy of mine. We had uh, co-created a comic book called Conservation Corps. And um, it was these environmental uh, animal heroes. And we were at a convention. I think it was a Philadelphia comic convention. And, um, you know, the, I, I tell this story a lot, but it's an important story. I think, um, you know, it was at the time when they had Death of Superman and all these big events happening. And there were all these superstar artists and writers at the conventions and people would line up for them and they would have the comics all bagged and boarded and they'd be waiting in line and they'd have multiple copies because the publishers would put like 10 different covers out for the same issue. So the insides would always be the same, but there'd be 10 <laughs> different covers. Yeah, yeah. And these guys had super lines and my buddy Dan and I, we didn't have any lines, but little kids came up to us and started talking to us about our characters and really getting in depth about them. And even to the point where there was a couple of things I didn't even remember, you know, and I wrote the thing, you mm -hmm. know, with Dan and it's like, wait, oh yeah, that's right. And it hit me like, you know, Joe Superstar at the next table with the super long line, a lot of those fans weren't ever going to read the comic book. They were just going to have it there bagged and boarded and get the, the signature of the person, you know, and, in, in gold or silver ink and, and see if they can sell it later, you know? And, I, and it hit me, I'm like, oh, you know, it's it's much more gratifying to know that, you know, my fans are reading it and invested in the characters and the storyline, mm -hmm. um, you know, than if it's ever gonna have any worth someday, you know? Right, right, right. You well, that, I mean, yeah, so the Kiss comic. I think that worth, the, yeah. worth is in, the worth is in that, that we, mm -hmm. you know, touched some kids' lives and, you know, affected them in a positive way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I used to use my comic books when I had them. You know, I was just a young kid when I had them. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I was cutting out ads. You know, I, you know, my my parents finally broke down and bought me the Sea Monkeys, you know, which was a ripoff. You know, but um, <laughs> uh, you, you remember all the ads they had in there for the uh, oh god, what was it? You know, they they, they sold actual monkeys, which was they were, they were uh, weren't they some kind of. Um crawfish or something or well, well the the sea monkeys themselves it was a um they were brine shrimp brine larvae. shrimp that's what it was yeah. brine shrimp but they were actually selling actual monkeys they would send them in a little cage to your oh house. yeah yeah there's a lot of ads when yeah. i was doing um research at archie for um the archie americana series of reprints yeah. we, we yeah. did these vintage collections best in the 1940s best in the mm -hmm. 1950s i had to go look through almost the entire library mm -hmm. of Archie publications. Archie had most of most of everything it had published. They had put together in what's called bound volumes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in a year, there could be like a year of Jughead. There could be 12 issues. Mm -hmm. And they would send it to the binder and the binder would put it together under hard cover. And they put a, you know, something on the spine that said, this is issues, you know, 34 through 46 from December, you know, 1957 through, you know, March 1958 or whatever it was, you know. And so they had most of the stuff they were published. 
And part of my job putting these books together was I had to, that was how I did my research. I looked through these comics, but I was always running against those ads. I was always coming up against those ads for the monkeys, mm -hmm. the actual real monkeys, um, and all kinds of other stuff that would vacuum tax, which was mm -hmm. this thing that was supposed to vacuum blackheads out of your face. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, there was and, always and something that something that would be really disturbing now. It probably was then too. Was Hitler stamps? Oh yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The postage stamps. They were selling those. Um, mm. uh, yeah, they would sell all kinds of crazy stuff. There's a yeah. book. There's a. Um, there's a book, it might be out of print now, but it may still be available, called Hey Skinny. Yes, it's, yes, it's a, I was going yeah, to say that. that book? Yeah. It's a collection of those ads. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it was great. Oh, yeah, and then... And then um, I was a 97-pound weakling, and people kicked sand in my face, but then I bought the Charles Atlas, and I don't even know what it was that you bought from them, I guess, but whatever yeah. you bought from them, you weren't 97 pounds anymore, and you're ready to go kick some butt, you know? I think it was a lot of candy bars. <laughs> It could have been, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, but yeah, there was the cartooning correspondence school. Like, can you draw mm -hmm. Bob Hope? And it was like, you know, it was <laughs> yeah. like his profile with the ski and mm -hmm. you know, there was all um, kinds of stuff in there. You know, from the from the from the mundane to the sublime to the ridiculous right. to the disturbing. <laughs> yeah, the um the Venus flytrap plants, um, the Frankenstein, the life size Frankenstein oh, poster. Oh yeah. Um there was um, some sort of like a kite with a Dracula face on it with a real long tail or oh, something. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. All kinds of stuff. Army the Frankenstein Man. was, yeah. um, I believe, Jack Davis, the famous yeah. cartoonist from Mad, and he had done the poster. Well, mm -hmm. he had done some, he didn't, I don't think, I think Frank Frazetta did the poster for Mad Monster Party. Mm. Jack Davis did some, some art, promotional art for it too, as far as I know. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah. And um, that stuff was great. That that Frankenstein used mm -hmm. to scare me just looking at the ad. I was scared of that thing. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. And um, but it was like, like it, I wanted so much of that stuff. My parents finally broke down and we got the sea monkeys. I think they lasted about a week. Um, you just they, it, it was like a little envelope of eggs. You dump them in the water, and then all of a sudden you see these little things swimming around, and they were just they actually had on the side of the little tank like a magnifying glass embedded in the side of the tank that they would swim by. So you could kind of see that they looked remotely like the creatures, you know. But of course, you know, my five or six year old mind was expecting the actual little people with horns oh and yeah yeah because they were so wonderfully drawn and, so very yeah, talking, and, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you know the thing about that is if you saw that if you saw th those faces mm -hmm. and bodies in real life yeah in three dimensions mm -hmm. in kind of like slimy pink fleshy weirdness you'd probably yeah. be scared out of your mind oh yeah oh yeah real. <laughs> that's the truth isn't it i mean it's just like um <laughs> And the they thing is, cool as a cartoon, but yeah, yeah I mean, it, if you look back on some things too, like some of the things that they had on television, like my God, this was some of the scariest stuff ever. Um, like half of Fred Rogers' puppets. <laughs> good Lord, you know, uh, Lady Elaine. Good Lord. That, that, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, know. yeah, it was. Um, I think it's all evolution, right? Mm -hmm, of, yeah, any yeah. Of these things is, um, you know, because Punch and Judy shows. Mm -hmm. those are some pretty scary puppets you know and that's yep. you know but that's mm -hmm. way before anything right that's before yeah movies radio anything yep. um Com comedy I del arts years, I think, things yeah. softened a bit you know yeah when i was in oh i guess maybe three or four years old they had uh these puppeteers would come around to the malls and they would put on puppet shows for the kids and you know, we would all sit down on the floor and they'd have the little puppet stage and the mothers would sit off to the side in chairs and uh, they were called Paul's Puppets. And there was a little, one of them, he was the host of the show. His name was Jojo. And he looked like a Punch and Judy. He had his nose like hooked down, his chin hooked up. And he comes out, hi, boys and girls. And we're all like, ah! <laughs> we went, with, and we all ran and like buried our heads in our mother's laps. He did his little thing. And then when he went down and the other puppets came out, we went back. But um, I mean, some of that stuff was just like horrifying. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, one of my favorite movies of all time is um, 
Babes in Toyland, also yes. known as March, March of the Soldiers, mm -hmm. a little Hardy film. And, uh, you know, I loved that film when I was a kid. It was on every Christmas and, and um, Thanksgiving, especially mm -hmm. Thanksgiving uh, in the New York City area. Um, and, but, you know, there was stuff in there that was pretty scary. Those bogeymen were scary. Yeah. The three little pigs were kind of weird looking, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it, um, I'm writing this book about, you know, old comedy films that have spooky elements. And, you know, I have to kind of include that just because even though it's technically more of a fantasy fairy tale type story, mm -hmm. there is this kind of horror element to it. Oh, there is. There uh, is. You know, for sure. You know, I think there's I think there's probably a generation of child psychiatrists out there that owe their practices to helping people get over watching these things. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, there's just some of this stuff. I'm just like, like well, why are, are they not even are they just not bouncing this stuff off a kid? Is yeah, there no, te well, I guess there were no the, test markets back then or whatever, I think, you know? I think though it, it's one of the things that helped me get into, into spooky comedy, horror comedy, scary yeah, comedy, yeah. whatever you want to call it, because I was afraid of three things when I was real little. I was afraid of the Joker from Batman, Cesar mm -hmm. Romero. Uh, yep. I was afraid of Abbott and Stalin Frankenstein. Yep. Uh, and I was afraid of Herman Munster, the Munsters. Okay. Uh, okay. And and I was, you know, having stomach Frankenstein used to come on and run <laughs> out of the room. Same thing with the monsters. You know, whenever I saw that kind of Frankenstein monster, but then there was like that moment where I realized, oh, these are the funny versions. Yeah. yeah played, right. Right. Played for laughs, and so it's it's a lot of people say it's the gateway drug. <laughs> you watch some horror films if you if you start out watching Emma Stone Frankenstein as a little kid. Mm -hmm. and it really was because I, I, I don't think I really was able to get into Universal Monsters until I was a, like junior high. Sure, sure. Just for sure. a while, I just found them too scary, and but then it mm -hmm. was like after watching Abbott Costello so many times, I realized <laughs> oh, I, I can I can handle this, and then sort of through the back door, you know, I get into the, <laughs> the you know the legitimate horror stuff. Not not that the comedies are illegitimate, but you know what I'm saying right yeah, right it's meant to be scary not meant to be funny stuff exactly exactly um i was looking at some of your uh you know your blogs and some of your websites and everything and you've really got some great stuff on here um looking at you know the one that you have called scared silly classic yeah, that's, comic that's my, yeah that's my book project so it's a scared silly classic hollywood horror comedies mm -hmm. and um it's it's a it's the blog that accompanies my book um of the same name uh, that I'm right in the process of writing. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm attempting to review as many of these uh, shorts and features uh, from the 1930s through the mid 1960s as possible. Sure, There's a lot sure. of them. I was mm -hmm. gonna I was gonna include all the silent ones too for a while, but the problem I'm running again, up against with the silence is a lot of them are lost, and some of the ones that exist are hard to get a hold of. Yeah, and yeah. You can't yeah. write a review of something you don't watch, right? So, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's been a fun project. I mean, most of the comedians did these. Abbott and Costello, of course, you know, had the most famous ones because they got to play with the Universal Monsters. But mm -hmm. Laurel Hardy did a bunch. The Little Rascals, the Three Stooges, uh, the Bowery Boys, Martin and Lewis, Bob Hope, uh, Don Knotts. Mm -hmm. uh, so many people. Uh, did these films where they got mixed up in spooky situations yeah and i just really i just love those films uh oh, so yeah, the book is basically it's more it's mostly reviews there's going to be a little bit of backstory and history here and there and a little bit of the examination of of these things uh like I, I like to say there's this kind of um hairline thing that happens between screaming and laughing mm -hmm. you know it's mm -hmm. right on the edge and, yep. and the laughs are there to sort of provide the relief. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's just a fascinating topic for me. And it's been part of film since the beginning. Right. Uh, right. You look at George Millay stuff, uh, you know, you know, George Millay, he was the, the pioneering um, French um, filmmaker. Mm -hmm. And he was a stage musician, magician rather. And, um, you know, his whole thing was, I want to put illusions onto film, uh, but I don't want, I don't just want to shoot 
you know, my stage act, I want to do things I can only do with film too. So mm -hmm. he was yeah. very much uh, an innovator, but he would also mix in a lot of humor. So he knew like the audience was going to be like stunned by the stuff they, mm -hmm. they see. Uh, you know, audiences, you know, I always say you have to put yourself in the shoes of the audience that was watching it at the time that it was first shown, mm -hmm. right? Anything, because you don't know what their points of reference are. You don't know the context. You don't know their circumstances. So the big example is the great train robbery, mm -hmm. right? With uh, the trains coming right at the camera and therefore right at the audience. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, if you were there watching it for the first time, when it first came out, you would duck too. You know, <laughs> yeah, it seems yeah. silly to us now, but you mm -hmm. would. So Malay knew this. He knew that you had to have this like sort of comedic thing follow up a scare. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it's kind of been part of film right from the beginning. You know, right? Mixing, sure, sure. Mixing horror and comedy. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite horror comedy movies, and I've talked about this before, but I don't know if you had the same experience with this one, is um, Evil Dead Two. Um, oh yeah, well you know I'm not I'm not covering um, anything past 1966 in my yeah, book. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. But I do have a fondness for 80s mm -hmm. horror films because a lot of them have crazy humor in them, and a lot of them are wildly imaginative mm -hmm. um, and colorful. And so I really do like them. And of course, I love Bruce Campbell. Oh, uh, who doesn't? Who doesn't? He's Evil, great. Evil Dead. Evil Dead Two is a, is a great film. I I I liked Army of Darkness a little better personally. Mm -hmm. Uh, just because I, I like all that extra stuff they threw in there with the, with the <laughs> nights and the medieval times. I mm -hmm. thought it was funny. Uh, he's great. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I've watched all those films plus that TV show they did. Um, Briscoe County. Well, no, they did uh, uh, a oh, oh, Ash, Ash versus, versus the Evil Dead. Dead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. a TV series. So, I mean, he's always good. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's great stuff. But the '80s have the '80s have some really prime examples of mixing mm -hmm. horror and comedy. Um, you know, it's just that they they were um, also of their time a bit more gory. Uh, yes, yes, films and, and maybe some titillation thrown in every now and then too. And, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but I do uh, and like I said, Night of the Creeps, the 1985-86 film. Mm -hmm. This is just one of my all-time favorites. Uh, but there's so many from that that era that I, that I like. The marketing of Evil Dead 2, I thought, was just well played. You know, here, I'll give you the scenario here. Here I am, I was working on a Saturday night, get home from work, you know, at night, and I, you know, go to my room, turn on the stereo, get ready to rest for the night, and then I hear this radio ad, you know. You know, this movie is now out, and... You know, it is the most disturbing movie. It's been banned in 120 countries or however many countries it said. And it said, nobody with a heart condition under 18 or pregnant women will be allowed into the theater. And I was like, all right, I'm there. This is what I'm doing tonight. Yeah. So I and drive that's kind of, that's kind of Ballyhoo borrowed from, uh, you know, from forever. I mean, they were yeah, always, yeah, really. there were always guys, you know, of course, William Castle was mm -hmm. the king of Ballyhoo in the fifties with all his gimmicks. Uh, but even before that, uh, I've looked at a bunch of press kits mm -hmm. for different films, uh, and they're wild to, to see, like, especially Monogram. Monogram would always put out these, mm -hmm. these really cheapo, uh, poverty row horror films. A lot of them had Bella Lugosi, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and they, they did comedies too, these side kids and the Barry boys, but they would put out these <laughs> press kits, mm -hmm. you know, and they would encourage theaters to do these outlandish things to promote the films that <laughs> I see I wish I had examples in my head right now but they were the tingler they were borderline illegal things that they were encouraging the studios were encouraging mm -hmm. the theater owners to do all these crazy things to draw people into the theater to come come mm -hmm. see them but yeah that was when when Evil Dead 2 came out they were still doing things like that mm -hmm. like banned in 120 countries well they were right that kind of fell off yeah it fell off because I think distribution changed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, you know, as we got into the 90s, I think distribution started to change mm -hmm. because you could still have, you know, um, a movie on the road, so to speak. Yeah. Right? You mm -hmm. could have a few prints that just travel around the country from region mm -hmm. to region, you know, and then you only have you only had enough money to strike up a few prints. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, So you had to sell it town to town, literally. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I think that's kind of part and parcel of that type of value. Yeah. yeah. Because you got your one shot in Mm -hmm. uh, Muskegon, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, right, right, (laughs) right. Well, you know, the the other thing too is that, you know, I mean, that was kind of riding on the coattails of uh, Faces of Death. Cause that was part of their thing banned in and probably in more countries than there are in the world, but um, <laughs> they would use some number and um, yeah, that, really I remember when those videos came out, I, I always knew, I always had a radar detector to mm-hmm. steer clear. Like mm-hmm. I said, oh, this is not going to be entertaining for me. Right. It's not going to be fun or funny. I better stay away. And, <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, all I had to know about was the, the monkeys, the monkey scene and that, and I, yep. that's enough for me. I don't need to know anything else. I know, I know. How about, um, I wanted to ask you a little bit here, you know, in the next, you know, uh, next, I'd like to ask you about you know, your Laurel and Hardy blog cast. Um, yeah, well, it's not my blog cast. I was just a guest on it. A guest. Um, your episode is what I'm, I'm, I meant to say. Yeah, your that, epi- just hap- yeah. that just happened. Um, uh-huh. It's funny because um, there's this, this fellow, Patrick Vasey, out in England, mm-hmm. uh, doing this wonderful Laurel and Hardy blog. Uh, and he's chronologically going through the films, he's reviewing them, and he's also doing a podcast, mm-hmm. uh, and ultimately he's got a book coming out uh, reviewing the silent films of Laurel and Hardy, mm-hmm. uh, but he's also doing this podcast where he gets uh, different Laurel and Hardy aficionados and, and experts and historians to come on and, and talk about the different films. Mm. So it just so happened I reached out to him not realizing where he was in the chronology. I reached out and I said, hey, you know, I'm working on this Scared Silly project. I love the spooky comedies, the mm-hmm. Walmart, a bunch of them. And, you know, I mentioned a couple of the, the talkie films that they did in the 30s that I said, I would love to come on and talk about these films on your, on your podcast sometime. And he writes back, it just so happens the next film chronologically that I'm about to do is Habeas Corpus, which is a 1928 silent Laurel and Hardy scare mm. comedy. Wow. It takes place mostly in the graveyard. Mm. Um, and so he goes, this is like serendipity that you contacted me now. I said, well, great, you know, so let's do it. So we recorded it. Um, I think he put it up, um, I think the first weekend in July, um, he had it all um, edited and put together. Uh, we had recorded it uh, a week or so before that. But uh, yeah, it was great fun to talk about that short. Uh, what was funny about it was I had yet to write my own review of that film for my Scared Silly project. So in doing his blog and preparing for that and re-watching the film a number of times mm-hmm. uh, and boning up on my history of it, I was like, oh, okay, now, now I have to write that one next. That's going to yeah. be my next review. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm going to write that review up as soon as I can. Uh, I'm just, um, I'm getting over a bout of COVID. Yeah, uh, brutal. A huh? breakthrough case, you know, fully vaxxed and boosted mm. twice. Mm, me Double too. Boosted, and I still caught it. I think it's mm. this new variant. Uh, I mean, thankfully, you know, I quarantined at home and didn't mm-hmm. have to go to the hospital. And uh, But yeah, so I'm just sort of getting back into the speed of things, but hopefully I'll be able to write that. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's corpus review soon because I, I'm not a, I'm not a habeas corpse. So right, right. It all worked out in the end. Well, well, yeah. Well, I'm glad you're feeling better and everything too. I've uh I'm me, I'm coming off a of surgery myself. So oh, uh, I hear you. Yeah, yeah. It uh but I, I'm good now. I'm good now. So sure. um what I would like to do now is um this is the portion of the show called the shameless plug time, where you can shamelessly plug anything you would like to shamelessly plug. With no shamelessness spared and all shamelessness included. So go for it, Paul. <laughs> oh, gee. Well, I mean, okay. So I'll, I'll do a shameless plug. Um, what do I got? So a shameless plug that someone could uh, get now if they want uh, is it's from uh, the company Classics, Classic Flicks mm-hmm. uh, is, the, is the manufacturer. And it's the Abbott and Costello show season one. Uh, restored. Uh, you want to make sure it's the restored version. I think it's a 2K or 4K. I think it's 4K. Um, and it's um, basically it's the first season of the Abbott and Stella show, brilliantly restored uh, by Bob Fermanac, who is one of the foremost Abbott and Stella historians. 
he and Ron Palumbo wrote uh, a great book about them called Abbott and Costello in Hollywood. And Jack Thigston was also involved uh, and a bunch of other great people. And they did a great job restoring it. And in season one, there was an episode called The Haunted House. Uh, and they uh, had me uh, record the uh, commentary track for it, which was really cool. You know, a lot of fun, you know, just like doing that Laurel and Hardy podcast. Mm-hmm. You know, I get to talk about my favorite comedians mixed up in spooky situations. My Laurel and Hardy are my all time favorites. Mm-hmm. But I have like Stella right up there. They're, they're probably my next two favorites. And um, so, yeah, that's available out uh, from Classic, Classic Flex. It's probably on Amazon too. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you want to look for that. Um, and other than that, you know, I, I, um, uh, I, I do a, a thing at the West Orange Classic Film Festival mm-hmm. in uh, New Jersey, West Orange, New Jersey. Uh, annually, they have a festival and they usually have me come in for one of the screenings. Uh, tends to, it has kind of evolved into alternating between, surprise, Laurel and Hardy and Abbott Costello uh, every other year. And uh, they have me come in and do a little introduction and then a little Q&A afterwards. Uh, so I do that. That happens usually sometime between January and March of each new year. Uh, and usually when you go to my Scared Silly blog, which is scared silly by Paul paulcastiglia.blogspot.com. I know it's a mouthful. When you go <laughs> to my blog, I usually uh, promote that when it's coming so you would know, uh, you know what films we're going to show and if you want to show up to that. Um, but yeah, that's that's what I have going on. I have a couple of animation scripts uh, that are in a soon to be recorded and produced. Uh, they're not available yet, uh, but it's a couple uh, episodes for a show called Coco Talk, which is from a company called Minnow. Uh, and it's about, um, it's basically a little, a little tiny um, spoof of talk shows but it's aimed at real little kids and uh, gives them some good morals um, and, and some uh, kind of religious overtones to it and, and Christian um, um, morals and ethics in it. And oh, great but the show, but the, but the show is really, really funny. Mm-hmm. Um, my friend Jeremy, uh, he created it and it's fantastic. Uh, it's just, it's like they're a brother and a sister. It's a cocoa mug. So it's a mug, it's a blue mug. He's the host. And then the co-host is Marsha, the little marshmallow that floats the top. Of <laughs> okay. They're, yeah. like a, they're like a brother and sister. Oh, and so, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So they're like, you know, they're like Johnny and Ed, I guess, but, um, or, you know, uh, any of the others that have come since. Uh, but um, it's funny because uh, they all, they get to talking to each other so much that they never get to the guests. Mm-hmm. And they have one uh, guest on every week that they're trying to get on their pal fruitcake, and they, <laughs> they never ever get the fruitcake. So that's the running gag. Is that? Oh, okay. They never get to the guest. Uh, but <laughs> it, it's fun. It's funny. It's cute. And uh, that's I don't know when that might be. Sometime in the fall, mm-hmm. uh, maybe September, October. And um, yeah, that's really uh, that's all I can think of for right now. I mean, there's a lot of stuff I've done that's mm-hmm. like out there in perpetuity. Sure, uh, sure, sure. I worked on a book called the 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 MLJ um, Companion. The MLJ Companion uh, is co-written by, co-written, co-researched and co-edited uh, by my colleagues, Rick Offenberger and John B. Cook. And it's a history book of Archie before it was Archie when they had oh, all the yeah. characters. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's still in print. Uh, that that book um, it still sells from what I understand and I think it came out in 2016 mm-hmm. uh, Archie had done a collection of my Archie's Were Mystery Stories uh, in 2011 they put out a, a, a collection of it but um, it went out of print they haven't gone back to press yet uh, you know I'm hoping one day they maybe, maybe do like an omnibus mm-hmm. like the whole series at least the all the weird ones together you know like one mm-hmm. through 24 would be nice in a big collection. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, there's different comic stuff I worked on that's out there. Um, you know, some of that stuff you have to hunt and peck for, some of it's out of print. Uh, one, that, one thing that's, that stays in print 
uh, something I did a while back, back in 95, I think. Um, Midnight Marquee Press, you probably know them, mm-hmm. right? Right there in Baltimore. Yeah. And yeah. Um, so they, they have their actor series of books where they spotlight, you know, Boris Karloff, Lon Chaney mm-hmm. Jr., Bela Lugosi. So I wrote an essay for their Vincent Price book. And of course, my essay is about the comedic pairings that Vincent did with Peter Lorre. Oh, yeah, yeah. When they were together in The Raven, mm-hmm. and the Tales of Terror, and The Comedy of Terrors. So I basically wrote my essay about how they were very much like uh, a Laurel Hardy or an Abbott Costello pair in those films. Mm-hmm. And that book is <laughs> always available. Um, you know, Midnight Marquee Press, actor series, Vincent Price, uh, to get a hold of that. You can find my my essay, which, you know, 1995, you know, there's probably some grammatical errors in it. <laughs> And, and things I would wince at now if I reread it, but uh, but the, my heart was in the right place. And, uh, sure, you know, yeah. You could see uh, the kind of, uh, almost in a way, it was kind of uh, a precursor to the Scared Silly Project, mm-hmm. if you think about it. Mm-hmm. Well, great, great. Well, look, I, I appreciate you spending the time with us today. Uh, this has been very, very interesting. I've enjoyed uh, talking about the things that you've done here and, you um, I think a lot of the things are, um, you know, since you and I are pretty close in age, you know, a lot of these references don't, you know, nothing like that. You know, we're able to uh, remember what we both enjoyed and everything here. So, folks, this has been Paul Castiglia here on Foul Players Radio. You know where to find his stuff. And I will also put some links in the show notes that you can look at and click and click on and uh, find out more about them. So, uh, Paul, thank you very much for being here today. We really appreciate your time. And oh, it was great. Fantastic. I love speaking with you. Well, thank you so much. And we will see you all next time, folks. This has been Paul Castiglia on Foul Players Radio. Thank you, Robert. Well, folks, thank you for tuning into this episode with Paul Castiglia here on Foul Players Radio. Again, make sure you check out his links in the show notes and uh, check out his blog, Scared Silly. And also um, check him out on the Laurel and Hardy podcast, his episode on habeas corpus. It was a lot of fun to listen to. Um, Coming up next on Foul Players Radio is uh, Baltimore-based filmmaker Johnny Lang. He just recently released a movie called Baltimore Bomb, and it's on Father Son Productions. Make sure you check that out. We'll have more about that next week. In the meantime, pass the word around about Foul Players Radio. Pass our YouTube link around, pass our Buzzsprout link, www.foulplayersradio.com. Pass them around and tell all your friends to check it out. You're doing a lot of traveling this summer. It's a great listen while you're on the road. So make sure you do that. And until then, we'll see you next time. This is Michael Spedden, www.foulplayersradio.com, and catch us on YouTube. We'll see you later.